Hey everyone, Old School Pokemon here, back again with podcast episode number 10. Finally reached those double digits, joined with my co-host, Catch Em All Collectibles, Dan. Dan, it's been super long time, a whole week <laughs> between podcast episodes. Yeah. How, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing really well, how are you? I'm doing good. So we decided to upload or record and upload this uh podcast a week after the episode nine to kind of get back on schedule here um so going forward it'll be every other every other week uh like we were doing in the past for a before i screwed up our schedule but uh <laughs> yeah we'll get started right away with the questions from last episode and you actually have a lot more questions than I do this week. <laughs> yeah, so I'll I'll kick us off this week. Um, Shiny Light Bulb 1000, paraphrasing, but they noticed varying brightness or kind of saturation of cards in base set. They asked if it was normal. Are, are some of them fake? It's pretty likely that they're all real. I mean, if you believe that they're real. There's several print runs that went into base set from several different printers so it, it's not abnormal to see different hues or saturations or brightness levels to um especially when you take into account the fact that these are 20 years old and what you are describing could even be sun fading to some of them so that that's my thoughts on that anything to add yeah no i would i would agree with you on that one um I do know that there's Rusty's big into this. There's some some like variant where it's like a it's almost like a matte finish versus a glossy finish. Like the regular unlimited base cards have that like almost like glossy finish, where these ones have like a matte finish. Um, so I know that's a thing. And then I know the the fourth print cards, the ones with the 1999 to 2000 copyright. Um, those ones those ones look a little bit lighter than the uh your normal unlimited base set so it's it's probably just a slight variation uh versus them being fake usually you can spot fake cards really easily especially from like the the base set jungle set fossil set um for the most part those are those are really easy to spot yeah um so my first question is from nerd neck he asks or he or she um, how many e-reader cards, specifically Aquapolis and Skyridge, do you think are sitting at PSA right now? Um, and he's, I also cut a portion of this question off. He's asking this question because he's looking to, he's looking to purchase some e-reader cards and he's wondering whether or not he should hold off for right now or whether he should, um, just go ahead and purchase them. Um, uh, basically wondering what the pricing is going to do on these. And so my answer to that would be, I think Aquapolis and Skyridge, uh, mainly, mainly any of the e-reader sets, so Expedition, Aquapolis, or Skyridge, I don't think there was, there'd be too, too many of those types of cards at PSA, uh, especially if you're talking the holo cards versus just the non-holo cards. And I think where the, where, the, where the booster boxes and booster packs for those sets are so scarce, I think it just um correlates to the scarcity of the cards as well and the fact that there really aren't that many mint e-reader cards out there um right now yeah. so that would be that would be my thing yeah i know personally back in the day i was out of the hobby before the e-reader sets so i didn't have any from my youth in, in those sets I have a lot of cards in PSA's backlog. I have very few e-reader. Um, mostly non-hollow, if anything at all. I don't think I have any hollow Aquapolis or Skyridge there. Um, and I made a note too. If you look at Pokemon price or if you look at Pokemetrics, some of these websites that, that track the pop data over time, you'll see with sets like Base, Unlimited especially, Jungle Fossil, Team Rocket. The populations over the past several years, they had a steady, I don't know which way I'm going here. They had a steady um, 
a steady slope kind of fairly in increasing over time, fairly steady. Well, when late 2020 hit, you kind of saw an inflection point where they were taking up in those early sets. I think we're still in the, the uptrend on the, the, the upward inflection. Whereas if you look at some of the e-reader hollows, they had a much lower slope to begin with. And you're not really seeing, I mean, you might see a little bit of a rise, but nothing like jungle and fossil. So some amount of them are at PSA significantly less than the early sets. I think that if you're buying them right, maybe looking at auctions, I think you can get pretty reasonable deals now. And I don't think you're at a huge risk of continued price declines from where we're at now. Yeah. No, I think, <clears throat> I think the e-reader cards are relatively safe given that the majority, I don't, I don't think there's too, too many of them at PSA compared to like base through team rocket, I would say. Yeah. And, and where that backlog is right now, I, th I think we, we were talking before we started recording upcoming is like October, October onward is when people were really shoving things out to the grading companies and those are going to be those early Watsi sets, the, the, the main culprits. So e-reader, if, if anything, I mean, I'm not saying they're not going to decline at all, but if, and when they do, it's going to be quite substantially less than, than the other sets, I think. And uh, I, I think you might, you run more risk of the prices increasing if you don't buy them sooner than, uh, than them decreasing significantly, if you buy them like too soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, would, I would agree with that. If you've got the money and if you're happy with the prices that they're at currently, I, I think it's a, a relatively reasonable thing to just start picking them up as you see good deals. <clears throat> yeah, and like, and like what you were saying, look for the, look for the auctions versus buy it now. Because there, there, there are some decent deals right now um if you if you look for look for auctions and stuff like that mm -hmm. so my next question <clears throat> jason of j and j's mentioned that he was back into the hobby last summer he has a pretty good variety of slabs sealed product japanese product he asked what do you think is the best way to make money in the hobby he originally thought it would be to buy, grade, and flip cards, but with PSA being virtually closed, that has become di difficult. He mentions that he's in the UK, so it's further significantly more difficult. Um, he asks us, what is the best money maker for us? Um, I guess first off, being in the UK, I'm always amazed at the people who are able to overcome their De definitely higher hurdles and a higher bar to just do business of any kind being further away from like the main markets and having the further complicated and more expensive tax tax implications importing and all that but um honestly the best money maker for me last year was crazy <laughs> B basically capital appreciation ju just everything going up five to ten times last year was my best money maker having having accumulated so much product over six to seven years and then having having so much of it that I had forgotten about over the years and, and just kind of combination of collection and inventory uh obviously you can't go back and replicate that because the hype came and went and and prices have retraced on a lot of things from then but thankfully I did I did sell during it I sold on the way up I sold at the peak I sold on the way back down a lot of it um overall again something you can't re replicate at at the current day but graded cards did do really well graded cards did well during that I, I was sending regularly throughout last year as those have been coming back, I've done well with them. Um, I'll, we'll touch on it a little bit more in a further question about strategies and, but same thing, 
2020 was quite crazy for modern product. Never in the history of Pokemon, except going way back to 1999, maybe, could you just buy wholesale booster boxes and sell them for double, double MSRP right off the bat. So unfortunately, the best money makers for me for the past year aren't replicable today. Um, they were kind of flash in the pan type things that are gone. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, well, the ne uh, one of my later questions will kind of touch a little more deeply into how we do something today. Um, so I don't know what your what your thoughts are on that question. What are your your best money makers? Uh, well, first off, um, I actually had so I had a I had someone in he wasn't in the UK, but he was in he was in Europe. Um, I want to say he was in Belgium or Germany, one of the, one of those two countries, and. He was actually buying CP6 booster boxes from me, uh, the, the Japanese evolutions. Mm -hmm. And he was buying them for me for 2000 And then I'd ship them to him. And then after he received them, he'd be able to sell them in Europe for like 2800 3000 bucks. So I think there is potential there. Um, just buying something in the States, having it shipped overseas, and then selling it uh, wherever you live. Uh, so that might be something you, you'd want to look into. But for me, the best money maker would have to be probably single cards. That's, that's kind of always been my, my thing that I've, that I've consistently done well with. Um, it's not a ton of money, but it's, it's consistent enough where it's, it's decent money, I would say. Um, so Watsy, Watsy single cards would be, would be my thing. Like the, like the commons and uncommons, the, the non hollow cards. Mm. And then you do, I mean, you do modern, you, you're, you're tapped into wholesale distribution. Yeah, yeah. So you're doing modern sealed product and, and you do some amount of graded too. I, I think we're both in, in a lot of different areas of the market. That, yeah, that's, that's a good thing is, um, just kind of branching out and having having different revenue streams is really important because there was there was a point um like december or january when i hardly had any graded cards i maybe had 20 or 30 graded cards and so if i hadn't if i was just strictly focusing on graded cards <clears throat> i wouldn't have anything to sell so during that time period, I was focusing on the single cards, uh, modern product, and different different stuff like that, until I was able to kind of replenish my graded card inventory. Mm. One thing I've, one thing that's still out there and it's available, <laughs> and that I've consistently done over the years, almost tying back into our last answer, is I buy large collections. I, I kind of took a break on doing it for a couple of years, but anybody who's following my YouTube, I, I bought that large base set first edition collection at auction. I don't understand fully why people, I mean, I kind of get, they, they want to just sell everything in one go. They want to get rid of it all, but selling a lot of mixed grade things in, in a five figure single auction, you, you're just not going to, generally realize the full potential of splitting it up so what i do is i buy large collections of mixed items at auction for 40 to 70 percent of what they might be worth listed individually and then i do that work to break them down um I, i'm doing that right now on a, on a base set first edition so even though you can't really take cards get them graded and get them back you can you can um acquire graded inventory by just keeping an eye on big auctions and and buying them as a set and breaking them down that's true yeah i've i've had luck over the years doing that with some really massive collections uh and i mean this recent buy was was fairly expensive too but 
I, I bought some really diverse product uh, collections, sealed product, raw stuff, graded stuff. And th those are some of my most, I, I wish I was on YouTube years ago because oh, yeah. I, bought, oh, yeah. I, I bought some amazing collections. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't even imagine what they would have been worth if I still had them all intact today. That's uh, like, um, do you remember, do you remember, this is, this is completely, yeah, I guess it's along the same topic, but uh, <laughs> speak, speaking of um, buying lots of graded cards, do you remember all the BCCG cards that were like mint 10 plus? Mm -hmm. um, someone had a ton of the Japanese um, Neo, the like the Neophile, uh, Etni, Charizard, and then P2. Yep. And I bought, I must have bought like a hundred of each of those <laughs> for dirt cheap because he did like um, big lots at auction. Mm -hmm. And so I <clears throat> bought, bought those and I would sell them as like the three, three card set. And ba back then they were selling for like 10 bucks for the three card set. But um, yeah, that was, that was just one example of you can, you can get them for dirt cheap and um, make a, make a bit of money on them. And I I anticipate that with the um, the prices having dropped fairly substantially on certain cards, certain sets these past several months, I do anticipate that this summer into this fall that there might be more of those auctions going up that people just get their PSA return back. They're not happy with they're not interested in Pokemon anymore because they can't go scout product from Walmart or Target for profit. And I just want to offload my hundred card PSA submission. I'm going to keep my eye out and try to buy lots like that. Yeah, definitely. There's been, there's been, there's been some decent graded lots on Facebook that I've seen. Nothing, nothing spectacular, but there have been, there have been a few decent deals where someone probably just got a submission back and they're just trying to offload everything uh, mm. where they don't have the time to break it down and sell it individually or they're just not interested anymore yeah so there is there is some good there is some good opportunity there i would i would think or yeah as, as long as you pay the right price obviously don't yeah that's, don't... that's the tricky part is figuring out what you're what you're going to offer and what you can pay in order to in order to make a make a profit yourself yeah, if you're buying, if you're buying something that someone's trying to offload quickly, on an item that is trending downward, you've got to be careful. They say uh, don't try to catch a falling knife. So just yeah, yeah, know know what you're buying into and be aware of the risk. Yeah, exactly. Although, what are so what have what have your best purchases been? Like mine, my best purchases are always the ones where I just have a gut feeling that's going to be good without doing, without doing any research whatsoever. Uh, I, d I just feel like it's going to be a good purchase and it turns out to be a great purchase. I've had a lot of good purchases <laughs> over the years. Um, a mix of, and a lot of that's based on luck. A lot of that's based on the fact that. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I bought, I, I got in before it went as I mean I got it in 2014 and if you look at the price history of most cars between 2014 and now it's been a, a, a steady trend up with some big jumps here and there um but I've bought some single cards raw I mean some of the the trophy Pikachus that I have mm -hmm. the prices that I paid two years ago compared to what they're worth now and I bought some massive collections that just I had one guy, I, so someday I got to do a video. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of the stuff anymore because I flipped a lot of it or added it to my collection. And uh, I had a guy drive from Canada in like one of those Mercedes vans, like not a minivan, like a full-size van. And it was like full. It was a full van of binders and monster boxes and sealed EX era packs nearly a complete PSA 9 gold star set Man. Um, nearly a complete PSA 9 EX set so many promos so many it was I, I still have totes around that I need to get finished and I bought that like five years ago um, 
<laughs> so yeah, I, I've bought a diverse array of very good buys over the years. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, no, I wish I wish I yeah, like like you were saying earlier, I wish we could go back and kind of record everything that we bought over the years because it, it's crazy to think of look back and think about what what the pricing was like back back when we when we first got into this and compared compared to today yeah it's it's insane and i i paid i mean that was a big collection back then to spend it was nearly forty thousand dollars back back then <laughs> that's yeah that that's a uh that'd be a bit more today that would have been uh i don't know if it would have been 10x on everything that was there but pretty pretty near that would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars oh yeah oh yeah definitely <laughs> that was quite the buy that, that would have been really fun if i had had i would that would have been a, a multiple youtube video series going over that the deal and then just going over all of it and discussing the sales from it and that would have been a lot of fun oh yeah oh yeah that would have been that would have been a like um do you remember do you remember rusty's um when he rented the u-haul and he went to pick up the uh he met some it was a person who was a gym gym trainer or gym leader whatever um, yeah today and they just had all kinds of stuff laying around and he he bought everything from from them i he, love those videos you know. <laughs> pokey rev did a video where he bought stuff with um cool trainer ryan yep and they just talked about yeah this guy had a card shop and they, and they bought all his pokemon and maybe some Yu-Gi-Oh and other stuff like that and i love those type of videos that type oh, yeah. Of oh, yeah. where people just dive into big buys like that they're really fun to to watch <clears throat> yeah i've never i've never had an insane buy like that that'd be that'd be fun where you, where you have like a whole whole truck full of stuff to go through yeah I, I really only had the one with like so much bulk to it but i've had i've had other pretty high tier i mean five figure buys years ago that, that were pretty substantial and would have made for good content oh hopefully, yeah oh yeah definitely <laughs> hopefully i'll find more but i mean they're they're few and far between and obviously the numbers are just massive now <laughs> yeah it would, it would cost you a whole lot more nowadays you you can fit in a single tote a half a million dollars worth of stuff so it's like <laughs> yeah it, it's tough to even envision a collection like that anymore because it would just be too much money way too much money oh yeah oh yeah exactly <clears throat> well i think i think we thoroughly thoroughly answered that question there yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> um, so my second question is from Basic Trainer. He says, today there are PokeTubers like yourself, uh, whether it's content regarding grading and selling, peer collecting, the TCG, box breakers, gaming, knowledge professors, etc. Back in the dead era of Pokemon, which I assume he's talking like the uh, like Diamond and Pearl through Black and White era back in 2007 to whenever um but yeah back back in the dead era of pokemon content creators did not exist are pokytubers like yourself now the bridge between another dead era in the hobby that won't allow the dead era to actually come to fruition in the future due to the constant content you provide that's an interesting question um i would say i don't think it, it's tough to say like we'll never have another dead era in the hobby. Um, but I can't picture a scenario where we would even come close to something like that. Um, just, just because of how much demand there is right now and how, how popular Pokemon is right now. But mm. I do think having all the PokeTubers does help um, kind of help prevent against that where you do have so many people watching these different channels uh obviously channels bigger than us but um 
uh, where there's where there's so many people watching these different channels and so much interest in in these different channels, I do think I do think it could help to some extent to kind of like prevent uh, another dead era from occurring. I'd never I'd never thought about that though. Yeah, it's in those eras there wasn't much going on social media wise, right? Not, not yeah. was YouTube even a thing? I don't know, but. I don't it, think it was a thing. Occasionally I find myself like reminiscing back on the time that I wasn't in the hobby. I, I look at like Pokey Jim and I look way back in the early days of E4, like b way before I was on it, just reading these threads and it's, like some amount of history was captured in there, mm -hmm. but now, like if we ever do get into a dead era again, now you'll have, I mean, a lot of people will be gone, but some amount of, hopefully our podcast will still be around to kind of time capsule, preserve the era. But it would be really interesting to just see what kind of content was being made, kind of like the mood and the discussion, what it revolved around. Um, so I, I don't ever, like you said, I don't really ever see it getting as low as it was back then. Because it's crazy to think these these base set boxes that were retail was a hundred back in the day, right? Ninety nine, nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. The hype, the mania. People were buying them for multiples of that. But there was a several year period. I mean, a decade period, maybe where those boxes were not worth much of anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, like, I don't really see, I don't really see us going into a prolonged period. I mean, I think you could buy base set packs at like the dollar store, right? I mean, base through Rocket. I, I think some amount of those were going for like a couple dollars, dollar, really low. I remember, I remember buying in, it, it was always like 50, 100 packs, but I remember... 2010 2011 buying unlimited jungle and fossil packs for two bucks a piece and they were they were definitely unweighed nobody knew about uh weighing packs back then yeah <laughs> Create, like i i don't think we're gonna go where you're buying uh battle styles chilling rain for like a buck a pack i mean we did see only a few years ago crimson invasion got down to where people were dumping boxes for 50. I heard people say 50 or 60. I never saw that. I, saw those, yeah. I definitely saw like 70. Yep. 69.99 shipped on eBay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe that could happen again with, with some of these sets if we go where they really overprint and demand wanes. But I, I don't see like a broad era where everything goes so far down. I, I guess theoretically, though, I don't. Over the next hundred years, two hundred, at some point, it's going to happen, right? Like, I think, I think at some point, Pokemon will come to an end. Just yep. when that will be, what it will look like, we're so far away from it. It's so hard to speculate, but it's, it's a fun, it's, it's interesting thing to think about. Not yeah. necessarily fun to think about, but interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can definitely see like specific sets being dead like that, but the the, the entire market. Um, I definitely, definitely can't picture a scenario like that. Yeah. So my, my next question came from Swami. Um, really interesting question, I think. Is there anything you miss about the 2020 mania? He mentions that discords were always full and something was happening every week, it seemed like. <clears throat> so to me, it still feels like something's happening every week. I mean, these, these conventions that are going on, I'm not going to them, but if, if you go on Instagram, if you go on YouTube, this weekend's the national, all these collecticons, all these collector con, all, it feels like there's something going on almost every week. E4 is still going pretty well. I, I'm backlogged on my YouTube. Uh, I've got a long watch later list. I can't keep up with all the content creators I like to consume. I've been a little bit too busy the past week or so, but um, so I, I think things are still like, I, some people are really down on the fact that prices are down on certain things and, but 
I think it's still an amazing time for the hobby. I'm still really excited about everything that's going on, these new modern releases. And uh, there's definitely some things I miss about the 2020 Mania, mainly the sale prices. <laughs> um, you could, yeah, there was almost nothing listed of anything. If you were listing an item, you'd look at the last sold, you'd add 20%. And you'd sell it, you'd list it, buy it now, and it would sell that day. Um, it was crazy. It was clearly unsustainable. Uh, <laughs> largely, that's gone for a lot. A lot of the sets have retraced and popped, crashed, whatever you want to say. But uh, so I definitely miss the pricing. I don't miss a lot, though. Like, it was a stressful time. Like, I, I have a fairly sizable collection. I parted ways in hindsight, I parted ways with some of it at the very top, but I also parted ways with some of it earlier in the summer. And then I had to continue to watch it go two times higher, three times higher than when I sold. So it was stressful from multiple angles. Like, man, I sold that too early. Should I sell this now? Should I sell everything now? Um, I probably lost some amount of sleep thinking over all that. And in hindsight, had I liquidated the perfect things at the perfect times, I could have literally made hundreds of thousands of dollars more than I did. Um, but you can't you can't get hung up on that. I, if, if we had all bought Dogecoin at the right time last year, we'd we'd all be uh, we'd all be riding in the rocket ships with Elon, right? Uh, <laughs> That's true. Uh, so yeah, there, there's things I miss. There's things I don't miss at all. Uh, it was a uh, de definitely it was a year that I will never forget. Um, however long I continue on in this hobby, hopefully a long time, 2020 will always stick in my memory as a wild year. <laughs> um, so what about you, Nick? Well, I just I just hate you for uh... <laughs> bringing up all those awesome points about 2020 because uh i uh, there's nothing that i miss about 2020 <laughs> i uh so i was i was home uh for the first half of 2020 i left to go back to work in like the beginning of june 2020 right as things were starting to you were starting to notice things picking up uh right around the time i left and i was gone from june till the end of november i got home like the day before thanksgiving and so the november and december were just me trying to wrap my head around everything that had happened and uh try and try and relearn the pokemon market because it was a completely different landscape but um i do remember like i didn't have i didn't have any access to ebay so i couldn't look look up ebay pricing um but i do remember like we were able to get on facebook and so I'd, I'd spend a bunch of time looking looking in the different pokemon facebook groups and i remember specifically keeping an eye on uh the unlimited base set booster boxes just because i had two at the time and i just kind of liked keeping up with those those prices and uh it was just craziness when i when i originally left back in june i want to say they were they were like five or six thousand then they jumped up to 10 then they jumped up to 20 then they jumped up to like 25 and at the peak they were like 30,000 um so it was it was just absolutely insane to me to try and try and understand what was happening I uh there were there were a lot of nights where like when we're when I'm when I'm working I, I work the night shift so it would be me and one other person on the uh where you do like the navigating of the ship um, so me and one other guy um, up there, and there were there were multiple nights where I'd be talking to the guy that I was standing watch with um, how much how much I regretted being on the ship right now because I just wanted to get home and start selling everything that I had. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it was it was it was. I wish I was home for it. Would have been would have been a lot of fun if I was home for it. But even even being away and just kind of looking on facebook looking on e4 every once in a while um it was it was a crazy time yeah but the one one good thing is uh i'm 
I'm kind of glad that I was away for it because I think I would have sold a lot of stuff back in July, August, September before that actual peak happened. And yeah. I think I think I would have regretted it because um, I think I think I would have sold a lot of stuff. I know with like my own eBay store, I never I rarely ever update pricing in terms of raising prices. The only time I'll update prices is is, is if I'm lowering prices. Uh, so yeah. I imagine I'd pretty much have sold out of everything. <laughs> yeah, and and I, I guess tying back into Jason's question a bit, what was one of our best money makers? My my backlog almost my having having too little time to effectively list everything, basically being lucky, mm -hmm. not having too much listed. Because I did, like I sold out of everything at one point, essentially, and then it took me so long to get th more things listed that we were like closer to the peak. Yeah. So almost my inability to to devote enough time to it really allowed me to capture more gains in some respects. And on certain things, I didn't have enough time to sell as much as maybe I wanted to mm -hmm. in October and November. So I guess I missed out on some on the tail end too. Yeah. But yeah, 2020 was crazy i mean i i still think today is crazy um it's so many great new sets coming out modern boxes are they're not selling for 200 anymore right after release but who knows maybe maybe evolving skies will for a short window it'll be it'll be interesting to see what evolving skies sells for um, yeah i think i think that i think that set has a lot more hype than chilling rain did i don't think that there wasn't there wasn't too much too too much hype for chilling rain uh, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens with Evolving Skies. Yeah, Evolving Skies seems to be a, a pretty solid set with some some good chase cards, and I wouldn't recommend anybody go out and, and place these really high pre orders. I I think patience is going to be key. Um, as you'll see, anybody who was buying two hundred dollar Vivid Voltage, you can buy that a lot cheaper now, and I I think we're gonna get to a point in the next year where most boxes are available in that i mean battle styles is down sub 100 now so in the 90 to 120 dollar window I, I think visit voltage and chilling rain are hanging out right around 120. Mm -hmm. so out of the gate evolving skies that first wave will probably just be gobbled right up and it might be a little high but i think um like i still haven't bought ev heroes m myself I'm waiting on, I think we're supposed to be getting a second wave of that, right? The, the Japanese, yeah. maybe I'll end up missing the boat on it. Maybe the price won't ever come back down where I think it will. But I think patience is key with modern because we're going to get back to where sets are available for a couple of years. I, I think demand has definitely waned to some extent. And I think they're really winding up their capacity on the on the printing end too yeah i can't i can't wait until we get back to a time where boxes aren't selling for msrp at release yeah uh, I, I almost miss booster boxes not being profitable yeah because i i like to i i do enjoy opening the packs and selling the individual cards but it's so tough for me to do that right now because it's I'm better off just selling the booster boxes sealed. Yeah, uh, I'm not making nearly as much money selling the individual cards, and yeah. it's a ton more work. Mm. But um, so it's it's tough for me right now because usually I like to open 15 boxes, um, and sell the sell the individual individual cards. But I I'm only getting uh 20 24 boxes per per release, so that's that's a good portion of my my available inventory so uh, it'll be it'll be nice when boxes aren't tempting to be sold as as sealed product and i can get back to just opening opening the packs and having kind of a um being able to order previous sets from from distribution versus basically just taking what they what they're offering yeah 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 that was a good question Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I think we have one final one from Celebi collectibles. Uh, again, paraphrasing here, 
they pose the scenario and they kind of summarize it themselves. So here's the scenario. You have $300 and you have 30 hours. You have no prior market knowledge and no distributor access. How would you spend those resources in your first month? So I guess there's, there's two different ways that I kind of read this question. One is putting myself back into my shoes. So I was in this scenario in 2014. Instead of 300, I started with 5,000 is what I kind of seated myself with. So I had a fair bit more. So I guess I don't know if I want to answer it as in my own shoes back in 2014, but just pretending that I was doing that today or knowing a bit more what I like, how, how would I, how would I suggest someone do it today? I guess it's more the first. Yeah, I, think, I think it's, I think if you're, if, if you're doing it today. So it's more the first one, like not what I would recommend, or do you think it's more the second one? No, I think it's more like if, if, if you were just starting out today uh, and you had 300 bucks, 30 hours, how would you, how would you go about it? So, I mean, I guess it's probably fairly likely that I would do it similar to what I did before. So going over what I did before um, and if I can kind of cheat and I would, I would spend my time in the first month, I would not spend any money. I was going to say the same thing. I don't remember the exact time frames. I can look back and I can see like what month I joined E4 and I can look back and see, I, I think I started buying stuff a year before I joined E4, but I know I was lurking on E4 for some amount of time. Maybe it was a year, honest. I, I don't remember, but. How, how did you, not to, not to completely. How did I originally like, find how E4? How did you find E4 originally? I don't even remember. <laughs> Um, honestly, I don't even remember. I, I sometimes I need to go back into my eBay purchases and go back into like my first post on E4 and just see if I can like remember because I honestly don't remember off the top of my head. But I know that probably probably well over 30 hours were spent time wise before I bought much of anything. Just interesting yeah like i i re and i guess a small amount of money i probably bought filling out like my my base jungle or i did that earlier though i did that before i think i did that in like 2011 before i was really back in i filled out my childhood binders and then i just stopped completely like i wish i had stayed in the hobby then but yeah the first month i would just go to E4, I would find some great podcasts on YouTube, like like maybe this one, and I would <laughs> I would spend my 30 hours absorbing information as much as possible. I would I would avoid the the hype channels. I would avoid any channel that said yeah. Buy exactly this because I will guarantee you exactly this return. I would just look for the channels that say this is what I'm doing and why not you should do this because this 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 is what i'm doing and why i i'm here i've built this off of like that, that's kind of to an extent what nick and i do um so yeah absorbing as much information as possible maybe month two month three um three hundred dollars is tough because it, it's really it, it's really not a lot um you can get I would I would not buy two chilling rain booster boxes or anything like that. I would not buy product at above um, above retail or even near near retail because as Nick was just saying, like opening product, we buy it wholesale and opening it and selling it oftentimes isn't even that profitable. I mean, especially three hundred dollars. If you're opening a hundred boxes, you're, you're going to get like an average distribution. If you open two, you could get two dud boxes and get no hits. You could you could turn your three hundred into one fifty or one hundred really quick. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Given that small of amount, I think buying a collection or two, buying a binder, um, just using your couple months worth of research. You really got to be smart with what you buy. You buy something 
fairly liquid that, that's in decent demand. Um, and I know it's it's easy to say and it's harder to do, but I would look to to just spend 300, double it up. And, I mean, churn it up as, as best I could over the next several months. I mean, that's essentially what I did. I started with five grand and I turned it into everything I have today started from that seed money. Um, $300, you've got you've to do an order of magnitude increase right off the bat to catch up, but it, it can be done. It's just a matter of smart buys and, and putting in the time and you'll get there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I would, I would agree with you where if we're, if we're doing, if we're doing like multiple months here, um, I would spend the first month just researching everything from, depending on if you know about how to sell on eBay, um, start with that, learn how to sell stuff on eBay, package orders, all that stuff, and then dive into your niche, niche, in this case, the Pokemon market, uh, start learning as much as you can, try and try and pick an area that you want to focus on. Uh, so for me, it was the Watsi era when I, when I first started out. Um, and that's actually something that I wish I did. Um, I, I basically got started on a whim where I, where I sold my childhood collection, realized that I really like selling on eBay and I wanted to keep selling on eBay. So the next weekend or a couple days later, um, after, after I sold my childhood collection, my dad and I went to one of his coin wholesalers and I saw some Pokemon cards there and made the connection that I, I sold my Pokemon cards for a decent bit of money. Maybe I could resell these cards for a little bit of money. Um, so I, I bought those cards and then basically started my eBay business from that. But so I didn't, I didn't spend any time researching. I knew, knew hardly anything about Pokemon when I started <laughs> and that definitely hurt me. So I would definitely spend the first month or so just, just researching uh, Pokemon, learning how to sell on eBay. And then once you have a kind of a bit of an understanding, I would go after definitely like what you said, a collection, whether that be an eBay auction, um, probably that's probably your best bet. Mm -hmm. Or I would probably recommend, depending upon where you live, um, yard sales and flea markets. I used to be big into that, just going to yard sales and flea markets every wing weekend looking for Pokemon cards. And I'd usually find some decent stuff. Uh, nothing, nothing spectacular, but um, some, some decent lots of cards. And they were always really cheap because the people who are selling them don't know much about them. They're just looking to get rid of them. So they're really not asking very much for them. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's probably, that's probably what I would do. I, yeah, I think, I think that's what I would do, but definitely, definitely the research first. That is, that is important versus just jumping head into it. Yeah. And, and so many things are harder about today. Like if you're already tapped into distribution, you're printing money to some extent. I mean, you, you're buying, when I started, I was paying 85 ish for a box because I was buying a couple boxes of each release. I, I started Phantom Forces. I bought a case through collector's cash or somebody. And then I found out about distribution. So the following set primal clash roaring skies, I lucked into a good time to get into it because roaring skies was a good set for playability. And, but I was buying boxes for 85 wholesale they were selling on eBay off the bat at 90 to hundred. I mean, you couldn't make money. Whereas now they're selling 120 ish. You can make a little money, but the problem is you can't get your foot in the door because distributors still aren't taking new people on. I don't believe. And then on top of that, like my first $5,000 that I put into it, I bought a couple collections. I could pay seven bucks a card, eight bucks a card, send them to PSA, have the cards back two months later and That's i think it was even cheaper back then I yeah remember, i remember like four fifty specials where if you oh, sold 25 cards in <laughs> i was never that low like you were no. 2010 you said right uh grading would probably be 2010 2011 
Yeah, I didn't start grading until like 2015, early 2015. Oh, okay, okay yeah, I, yeah. I might have saw 650, maybe six. That's what makes like like the coins I just got back. I got those in under the 750 special. It still nice. blows my mind that like I've been grading since 2015, and in 2015 I, I maybe paid six. Just in 2020, well, like today I'm still paying 750 on hundreds more cards that are still there. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a 400 card submission that I'm still waiting to get back. That's my last one from that quarterly special. Nice. <laughs> but in, in the midst of all this going on to be paying 750 a card is, is insanity. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, starting today, you're really in a way worse spot because you can't get in the door. Like if it was seven years ago, I, I would say to do exactly what I did. I would say to buy collections, grade the good stuff, help your margins there. Within a few months of doing all that, I got into distribution and I was buying like, I would, I used to buy the collection boxes and, and when one had a good promo, I, I'd go extra and I'd get like, like four cases instead of one case, mm -hmm. um, which, which at the time was like a lot of money. I mean. I think 1250 a box, 12 boxes. So I was paying, I mean, for me to spend a thousand bucks when a new set came out, that was like it was a lot of money. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Four sets a year, a thousand bucks a set. That was really a lot of money. Yep. Um, but yeah, buying, I mean, through the research that I did, I knew every time, every time a box came out like these with uh Charizard Venusaur or Blastoise, buy some more of those because those are going to be good promos good figures to sell coins pins and yep. i was breaking stuff down selling everything like that but you just can't do that today um maybe next year maybe next year things get back to normal you can start getting new accounts through distribution but i i don't really know um definitely i don't think i would, I don't think I would start with modern though because you're i think i think I think modern you you have to you have to be into selling before you get into modern unless it's like right now where modern's like yeah margins but when when it's like usual your typical mo margins on modern uh, it could definitely be depressing selling selling modern because you're you're yeah. razor, razor thin. I would definitely just in case five years from now something crazy like this happens again, I would definitely That's recommend. Cool getting getting the relationship established yeah ordering some amount of quantity because there's a lot of people that i think were in the business of pokemon last year that only did watsy stuff never did modern oh i don't want to touch that they kind of missed out on a lot of profit last year because they couldn't get graded cards turned around they sold everything they had they didn't have any connection to get modern product to, to really capitalize on the, on the double MSRP insanity that we had for, for six months there or whatever it was. Yeah, that's or, true. That's a good point there. Yeah. How did you, how did you originally hear, hear about uh, distributors? Again, it's tough. I don't even really remember. Um, I'd have to look back at my email. I, I know I started with I started with GTS and then I got into Mad Al later. But I, maybe E4, maybe I I think it's a fairly common thing that you'll see people ask on Facebook. Yeah. What do you got to do to start a business? What do you got to do to get wholesale? Yeah. I still remember finding the page because I was Google search it. Maybe yeah. I would watch yeah. YouTube videos how to get your business license, reseller's license. Um. <clears throat> I still remember finding that Pokemon website. I think it's easier to find now, but seven years ago, it was a little more hidden where the, who their distributors are mm -hmm. and the contact information for them. Cause I remember calling up, I, I think the first time I called up GTS, I'm like, Hey, I want to buy your stuff. And they're like, do you have this, this, this? And I'm like, what is that stuff? <laughs> um, so I, I kind of like contacted them before I even had all the proper stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, and, and it was less busy then. If you call them now, I mean, they're not going to talk to you. You're not going to get anybody yeah. on the phone. They're going to be very annoyed by a question like that. 
back then, I mean, I, I probably talked to somebody who was a bit more helpful. Go to your county's website, go to your state's website, look for this, look for that do everything at the county building, get a, get, get a business up and running, get that on file with us, and then you can start ordering. Um, yeah, a, a lot of the barrier to entry right now is, is a lot higher just because the grading situation and the distributor situation. But yeah. um, I mean, I would still recommend you do all the business permit stuff and, and get, your, get your thing on file with eBay because when you have three hundred dollars, if you have the legitimate business stuff, you don't have to pay the ten percent sales tax, or at least where I live in New York. I guess if you're in Oregon, it is. Ten percent. I pay like nine point seven five. That's absurd. My county is one of the highest ones. It varies throughout the state. Um, oh really? But yeah, in in my county, it's like thirty five bucks. To, to get the the resell it's called certificate of authority so if you have 300 bucks you're better off spending 35 on that so that you don't have to pay sales tax otherwise you're going to spend the same 30 bucks on sales tax and then everything you buy down the line you don't want to be paying sales tax on stuff you're buying for resale no definitely not so yeah that's i i guess that's what i do with Three hundred dollars in thirty hours. Um, <laughs> yeah, that that's that's really tough in in this in today's market. It was definitely doable back when, like back when back when we started. Uh, but three hundred dollars today that'd be that'd be really tough. And, and one thing, um, I think everyone has some amount of stuff. I, maybe it's cheating a little bit too, but I don't know if the three hundred dollars is assuming we went through our house and we sold some stuff kind of like uh, James was doing there with his Z's flips. Yep. Um, so I don't know if it's cheating to say it, but like go around your house, look for things that you could sell non-Pokemon because everyone has that old iPad you don't use anymore or some old textbooks. And not only the money that you can get to add to your 300 to buy product, but the experience you gain selling things is worth way more than the little bit of money you might get. I still remember my start on eBay and I'll never forget. Um, I went to, I think it was called EB games at the time to sell some old video games. I didn't play mm -hmm. and they offered me like 10 cents a piece, 50 cents a piece, couple of dollars for a lot of them. Yep. Yep. I'm like, no, I'm not going to take four bucks for this bag of games that probably <laughs> cost 400 originally <laughs> so i go home and i'm like mom give me your password for ebay i probably wasn't even old enough at the time to to have an account or anything i just took hers and yeah I, I sold a few games and i was so proud of myself thought i did so well i i sold the sims for playstation i PlayStation, remember that game the playstation 2 i think yeah yeah and i saw it like it didn't go for a lot i think i auctioned it and it went for like seven bucks but i'm like yeah i got seven bucks and they were only gonna give me 10 cents i'm like i'm way ahead here <laughs> well then i go to the post office without packaging supplies <laughs> and the padded envelopes that i buy now for like 12 cents a piece because yeah. i buy 500 at a time i paid like three dollars for it at the post office <laughs> And then the shipping was like $3 and the eBay fees and this and that. I don't think I got 10 cents. I might've gotten like nine cents all said and done, but the amount of money, like the value that I gained going through that experience and learning how the process works and, and learning like how much shipping and how much supplies cost. And that was very valuable. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, cheating a bit, but especially if you've never sold on eBay before, go through your house, find other stuff, throw it up on eBay, get, get kind of an idea of how the process works and get a little bit more capital going for you. Yeah, exactly. No, that'd be, that'd be, uh, I'm kind of cheating with my second account because I, I have it linked to my old school Pokemon account. So I don't have I don't have the selling limits or anything like that to deal with. But that'd be that'd be like an interesting experiment 
to to take a certain amount of money and see see what you could build out of that. I think that's kind of what James was talking about doing, and I don't know. He kind he kind of stopped that, or I don't was, know. He was, he was selling that? like nipples for baby bottles and stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, he was selling some um, like empty boxes too. I mean, he was cheating a bit, selling some of his uh, miscellaneous Pokemon stuff. But I have I have a handful of things around my house. I've I've kicked around the idea of starting a second eBay. One thing I used to do years ago is I used to sell. Well, over the years, I've sold several various things, but. I don't know if I want to sell anything non trading cards, non Pokemon, because I don't want to sell an old video game and get a negative feedback selling that and then have it affect my Pokemon account. So in, in the next month or two, I, I might start up a second account and maybe I'll, maybe I'll try to do some kind of a thing on that. I don't know. I'll have to give some thought on that, but. Mine is, I was, I was so um i was i had such such a drive to get my second ebay account going and i had such high expectations for it and after i did good for like a week i got a whole bunch of stuff listed on there after a week i just kind of said oh i can't i can't do this anymore <laughs> so I, I still have it there's still like a hundred items listed on there they sell slowly <laughs> um but any any time i see an email saying i have to ship one an item out from that account it's like oh man <laughs> but um at, at some point i'd like to i'd like to get back into it where once once i get caught up with with everything i have going on right now i would like to get back into it and kind of kind of branch out a little bit into um just kind of like a general reselling uh ebay store where you can go to flea markets and yard sales and pick up random things to sell because I, I do enjoy going to going to those types of sales and doing doing that on the weekend yeah i have i have a similar thought um over the years i've sold coins i've sold beer steins i've sold video games lego so if and when i ever find myself at a garage sale looking for pokemon cards i mean the knowledge that i have in those other markets if I see something, I'll pick it up. I mean, if I see something I can make a little money on, I'd pick it up. But like I said, I don't really want to sell it on my Pokemon eBay. So yeah, no, uh, I don't want to do that either. A second account will have to happen. Maybe I'll, I could throw a couple grand into an account and kind of start from scratch and see, see what I could build up. Well, I'll, I'll play around with the idea and maybe turn it into something. There you go. There you go. Could be could become more successful than uh, catch them all collectibles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I don't think it'll. I don't think like with my second account. I don't think it'll ever become nearly as successful. And that's that's just because I don't. I don't. I don't have the drive to put in the time. The amount of time that I do with with old school Pokemon. Yeah. That's that's the biggest reason there. <sighs> But I have I have a decent amount just just around the house that I could that I could start um, listing on there and selling. Got a got a lot of lot of coins um, from my dad's dad's old coin shop that mm. could uh, that'll that'll eventually get me started with a second account. Yeah, I've got I've got like miscellaneous electronics. I, I've got and I've got like leftover. From when I did coins, I've got leftover totes from when I did video games. I, I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff I could sell. Um, probably more than I even realize if I started digging. Something will happen there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the biggest thing is the time factor. That's that's the that's the killer part right there. <clears throat> Definitely it takes a lot of time. Yeah. But I think uh, I think that was a pretty good answer to that question there. Yeah, some really good questions. Yeah, every week we have good questions, but there were definitely some uh, some really good ones here. 
I liked I liked uh, I liked Celebi's question that that hypothetical starting a business question. That's that's always interesting to talk about. Yeah. And uh, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about? <clears throat> um. Anything big you're buying or selling? Any? I'm actually really excited for it. It's not a. It's not going to be big, but uh, I bought. I bought a whole bunch of square cut jungle uncommon cards, um, like 16 card set. I bought multiple sets of those and they're, they're obviously non-factory cut. Someone obviously had a whole bunch of uncommon sheets back in the day <laughs> and somehow got them cut. But uh, I picked those up for, I want to say I paid a buck 50 a card is what we agreed to. And uh, I think those are going to do decently well. I think I'll be able to sell those. I'm hoping to list those for like four ninety nine a piece, or the complete set for fifty bucks. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. We'll see how those do. But I'm I'm really excited for that because there's only there's been a few sales on eBay, not too many, and there's a few active listings on eBay, but they're all like thirty forty bucks a card. So I'll just be able to blow those guys out of the water. And uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how those cards go. I'm excited for that. And then I bought um, I bought another five sets of the uh, another five sealed sets of the uh, Kanto Jim Badge uh, promo cards. Mm -hmm. The guy who I bought my first lot from had five more that he wanted to sell, so I bought those, which I feel like those are a really good deal um but they're also pretty slow sellers um so i just i just thought that was a good price so i bought those and then thanks to your recommendation i bought a whole bunch of uh hidden fates etbs yeah. i bought uh 30 38 of them off of uh troll and toad using rusty's discount tca5 so if you watch these rusty thank you very much i appreciate that yep yeah i use that as well <laughs> <laughs> uh how about you did you buy, buy anything good this uh this week or so yeah since our podcast um i have like a handful of hidden fates graded in my ebay right now that i've been selling and I just felt like, let me check on where the ETBs are, where the packs are, raw binder sets. I bought a master set in a binder that seemed like a pretty good deal. Um, I picked that up for 1500 and it, it was like a master set of everything. It had all the promos. It had multiples of a lot of the promos and even some of the shiny vault stuff. Wow. So I think I'm going to go through anything that looks gem. We'll probably go to CGC and I'll see it in a year. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll probably do a higher service level for like if the Umbreon, Espeon, Charizard, if some of the, the bigger hitters look really clean. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of the, a lot of the cheaper ones will just go to my troll and toad Evo. Um, and then, as you said, I, I bought, I think I bought about 30 Hidden Fates ETBs, some amount of them from Troll and Toad, some amount from eBay. Um, just what the packs are going for. And then buying the ETB, you get you get 10 packs, the promo, I'm, the dice and the, the sleeves aren't much, but there's something, right? Um, I even noticed the, uh, the little deck dividers are on Troll and Toad for like 50 cents a piece. Yeah, you know, I don't yeah. know if they're selling for that, but like I I ordered from Troll and Toad, and if you so anyone out anybody out there who has an Evo account, you can email them Evo at trollandtoad.com, and you can have them add a pickup option to your account for shipping. It, it's not like a default thing; it won't be there if you've not had them add it. But once they add it, all you do is you buy something you pay for it and you select pickup and then you email them and say, Hey, this is my order number. Can you add that to my Evo account really quick, easy. <clears throat> so I bought, I bought like 20 ETBs, had them add it right to my Evo account. Um, Cause I, 
I mean, I bought hundreds of Hidden Fates ETBs when they came out and then the, the waves that came last year. But I always intended to sit on a decent amount and I just found that I had sold lower than I had realized. So, I mean, it would have been better to have had a $30 cost basis into these when I, like from when I originally bought them, but to, to get them for about 130 bucks a piece, I, I, I think it's a decent buy. I think Hidden Fates is going to be a standout set in a lot of people's memories and <clears throat> going to be a lot of nostalgia tied to it. So I want to have several hundred to a couple thousand packs for years from now. Um, other than that, PWCC is ongoing right now. I threw out a lot of bids. Uh, I've been losing a lot of my bids, but <laughs> One one thing I was talking with Nick about before we started recording, so I have like a complete PSA 9 Watsy Hollow set, first edition, that I love and I don't really want to get rid of. But one thing I'm finding is CGCs at auction are selling for really cheap, CGC 9s and 9.5 specifically. So one thing I'm currently undertaking, both the buy and sell side, um, I am downgrading my PSA 9s to CGC 9s or 9.5s. So selling off through PWCC, the PSA 9s I have, buying either through PWCC or Heritage, wherever. I actually just won on Heritage a, a complete CGC Jungle and Fossil or Jungle and Gym Challenge first edition sets. So yeah, that's kind of a big like re rebooting my refreshing rebooting my collection from those old PSA nines to to nice new clean looking CGC nines. There you go. Yeah, that that'll be good. Did the did the the CGC sets that you bought on Heritage? Did those include the like the the non hollows too? Were those graded? Were those were they the non hollows graded? Yep. You did, you did, those were, those were pretty decent buys then. Yeah, I, I, I think. Just, I just thought of that. I never, I didn't, I didn't look, read the description, but um, I figured it was just the, just the hollows. But if it was all the non-hollows too. The pictures only showed the hollows. Um, again, going back to like, I buy collections where people bundle a bunch of things together that in my opinion should not be bundled together i i think that those sellers would have been served much better sending the whole set to pwcc and individually selling every card oh yeah absolutely i really talk about like the reasons behind why that is um to, to buy all of them at once anyone who's collecting the set there's a good chance they have some of them already mm -hmm. So very few people are going to want to buy them all. I mean, some people don't sell it all. So they're not going to want to buy any duplicates because they're not going to want to have to deal with selling them off. Yep. Then you've got mixed grades. Some people want the whole jungle set, but they want it all CG9. Yep. Not eights, eight and a half, nines, nine and a half. Um, so yeah, I bought those whole sets. I, I might do like spreadsheets on them. I'm, I'm going to sell off the whole uncommon, common sets, non-hollow rares, everything non-hollow I'm going to sell because I don't, I don't want them graded. Yeah. I've got them raw mint and binders. <clears throat> um, but then, yeah, I'm, I'm going to PWCC this month. I actually had my PSA 9 jungle and fossil sets, base set two, because I just don't care to have base set two. Um, <laughs> I probably won't even replace that one. <laughs> uh, sorry for anyone out there who, who loves base set two, but nobody um yeah I, I think i think if i do a good job buying good deals at auction either of the complete sets or of the individual graded cards i think i can like cross over from psa 9 to cgc 9 or higher and extract a lot of money out while doing it um some people might think i'm crazy for doing that oh cgc's trash they're selling cheap for a reason but like I've graded thousands of cards with both. Their grading scale is legit. Like uh, these CGC nines that I'm buying, I'm looking at them closely. I, I've cracked a lot of packs. I've 
I've graded a lot of PSA nines and tens in my day. These CGC nines and nine and a halfs are legit. They're in good shape. If and when CGC doesn't last five, 10, 20 years down the line, I can always grade them with PSA again if I want to. Um, right now, right now it's two hundred dollars a card. Someday you'll be able to grade it for twenty dollars or less a card again. Years from now, I think, but that day will come. Um, oh yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, I, I think it's a good move for me to to take these cards that I, I plan on having for years and decades even, and just to me getting an equivalently conditioned card in a different piece of plastic while yeah. while extracting a lot of capital out of it um seems like a no-brainer to me oh yeah no I'd, I'd agree with you there i i really like cgc they're they're really growing on me uh i think i think they're really really good and their grading scale is is pretty pretty harsh too <laughs> yeah which is which is a good thing because you don't have the whole week 10 strong 10 uh debate um so i i actually i actually like that but um but yeah if you can if you can build a whole cgc nine set i think i'd prefer that to a psa nine set because i think i think the condition is going to be overall better um with the cgc's i know i got back my i just got back my uh uh, my hidden fate submission to CGC or from CGC, and a lot of the cards graded nines. There were a few nine fives, not a single ten in there. So, if that if I sent all those cards to PSA, I know I'd have gotten tens, uh, nines, maybe some eights. But that's the thing. I, I've had a lot of submissions where I'm like, I know if I had just sent this to PSA, I know that I would have gotten whether it's 20% tens or 50% tens, depending on the submission. And I'm looking at results where I've got eight, 9.5s and not a single 10. And mostly just like, like I've got a lot of CGC nines that are 0. 0.5 from a nine five. Yeah. And, yep. and that's the, if you look at auctions, um, you can get strong nines or even CGC nine and a half of a lot of these Watsy cards for at or below the PSA nine price. Um, and what, one thing that I know I'm going to lose is like the, the liquidity or the ability to auction them quickly. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to be in a way I'm extracting some amount of capital out of them but I'm also going to lose the ability. Like if I just decide I, I don't want them, it's riskier to dump obviously a CGC auction proven by the fact that I'm picking them up so cheap. Um, yeah, yeah. So, oh, so the same token, maybe where this is like a super long-term thing for you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't sell these cards anytime soon. So hopefully by the time you're ready to sell those cards, CGC will be fully established and have, yeah. that, have that um full full reputation and the thing is like if they're not if they never get it something big happens they go away whatever um you can always crack them out and you can always create them with whoever the new big dog is i mean there's no guarantee that right now like to everyone in this hobby to everyone who's collecting now psa has been around forever they're they're the guys and 10, 20 years from now, they may not be the guys. Who knows? I mean, I, I think they're going to be still. I, I think they're so big that they're – but but you never know. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see. And and I'm perfectly fine buying the card, not the not the slab, not the grade, not the, the three-letter acronym. The cert number? Yeah, not the cert number. <laughs> I mean, I think in some extreme instances, like especially buying those heritage sets and then selling off the, selling off the uncommons and commons and all the non hollows. Um, what are what it, are the non hollows graded? Did did it say? All variable, yeah, everywhere from eight to nine and a half. I don't think there was a single ten in either of the sets I won, but okay. mostly nines. I mean, there there were clean sets that were sent in. Whoever did it. 
<clears throat> but uh, yeah, I mean, I think if I if I do it extremely well, I, I think it's almost to where I could sell my PSA nine jungle set through a little bit of work selling off some extras. I almost think I could end up with two CGC nine sets if I wanted to. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, I could, I could definitely see that if and, you, uh, if and, you and to, right. to me, like take, take the cases out of the equation. Do you want, one raw mint jungle hollow set or do you want two with with a few hours of work like i, I i'm going towards the two yep yep like literally buy the cards not the grade not the acronym um i i think i think people are sleep. not everyone is because these cgc cards are selling for something and i i do see some of the bigger dogs some of some of the the key cards like the ones where the PSA 10 pop is super low, the CGC nines, nine and a halfs. Some people are definitely buying with an eye for like regrading with PSA down the line potentially or whatever. So, some of them do fairly well at auction and I, I lose the bid by a lot, but a decent amount of them I've been winning. So I think there's other people out there doing kind of the same thing. And I think it could pay off pretty well down the line. Um, yeah, I can I can definitely see that. I can see that for sure. That's a that's a good way of going about it too, because you're you're getting the same quality card and you're freeing up freeing up a decent bit of capital to buy other collections and make more money. It, and we kind of talked about this before, but <laughs> um some amount of my cards are two certs. Some amount of them are four certs. Nat Turner has already said that it, it seems like it's going to happen. Just it's a matter of when PSA is going to have sleeves down the line. Um, I really hope CGC just stays with their case, stays with the label they have now forever. Because PSA is headed for this thing. Oh, that's not the Lighthouse label. That's that's a two cert. I don't want it. That's a it, it becomes a headache every time they change their case. If, if CGC, that, that could almost be a big selling point for CGC and kind of like increase their brand down the line. I think a lot of people hate on their case and label too much, mostly the label. Um, but 10 years from now, if PSA is on their 35th case variant and CGC still got the same one, um, maybe that's kind of a pro for, for them that gets them a little more market acceptance and whatever. But yeah, I mean, like you just said, extracting the capital so that I can buy and sell with that and flip, turn that into more money. When you buy a card and you put it in PWCC's vault, it, it's not producing dividends. It's doing nothing for you. Um, a, a graded card, whatever it appreciates is what you gain. But Are taking, you, go ahead, you can finish. Yeah, taking that money out of it, doing something productive with it. I mean, you could turn it into t tomorrow something. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was just gonna say, are you actually, are you actually saying something negative about the PWCC vault? <laughs> what do you mean? Saying how, saying how when you send cards to the the vault, they don't do anything for you, because you're Mister, uh, you're Mister hyping up the PWCC vault all the time. Oh, I like it, but I, I definitely, a large amount of what I sent there is like stuff that I'm going to be sending through the auctions. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Having, thinking back to like last October, had, had I liquidated through PWCC my entire Watsi set, I mean, Neo and E-Reader e, e era, they haven't dropped nearly as substantially as like base and everything, but oh, I, I wish I sold my base jungle fossil last November or whenever the peak was. Um, oh yeah, like 70, was it Was it 70,000 for a Charizard PSA 9 or 60? Again, I heard 60, 70 happened, maybe one or two sold for that. Um, I, I think 50 is like a realistic where it actually peaked, but in, in if you take 70, it's dropped 60%. If you take 50, it's dropped 40 50%. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
it's dropped a lot in any case. Um, oh yeah. Well, that that's a good thing because I want to I want to upgrade my mine to a nine at some point. I have I have an eight right now, and I thought I didn't think it was ever going to happen, but now now that they're back down to a more reasonable price point. <laughs> I should have bid higher. Um, you you should have just bought that CGC set at Heritage. I I was I was considering that for a minute actually. It had a, it had a CGC nine Charizard. Yep, yep. There, I, there were a lot of nines in that set too. I only, nine Blastoise. I only lost by a little bit. Um, more than one big bid increment, and obviously you never know. Like even if you lose by one bid increment. They could their max bid could have been thirty thousand higher. I I mean yeah yeah. So anytime you hear someone say, "Oh, I lost by five dollars," well, you could have lost by five thousand, ten thousand. Um, yeah, exactly. Yep. But yeah, I, I I think whoever got that for I think it was a little over forty with the buyer's premium. I think that was an extremely solid buy. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, th I actually, I thought about that for a minute, but then there were, I thought I was going to get, I thought I was going to get a couple of Watsy boxes because <laughs> um, it was, it, they did the complete sets and then they did all the Watsy boxes. And um, mm. I thought, I thought I was going to get, I was really hoping to get that, um, the 144 count Team Rocket uh, long pack case. Mm-hmm. But that went that went for a lot higher than I thought it would. Yep. All the Watsy boxes sold for. There were a few that were decent deals where you could make a little bit of money on them, but there it was nothing crazy. And then the Japanese boxes went crazy. I could not believe the Japanese Neo boxes. Yeah, I, I bid on a lot of the boxes and I didn't win any. Yep. Um, I thought that. <sighs> Some people are saying, oh, it was the deal of a lifetime. And <laughs> I mean, I do not think there were any the, super deals. No, the prices have come down a lot off the peak for a lot of these boxes, but the prices are still way higher than they were a year or 14, 16 months ago. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think. I think some boxes still have a little ways to go down. I mean, it's hard to say exactly, but. I could see, I mean, Fossil kind of held tight at like 10, 10,000 10, is like a big psychological barrier. Um, I think if you see some of them fall below that, it will almost get people even more scared, but 10,000 is a lot of money. Oh yeah. I think, I think 10,000 used to be a bigger barrier than it is today. Cause I, I remember when, uh, what was it was Neo Destiny or Sky Ridge was the first one after after first base um, you know, to break 10,000. I, 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 it just made me think of the first base box from uh, Collector's Cash that Rusty bought and opened on his channel that oh, yeah. I, had, I had in my car ready to buy and I never I didn't pull the trigger. Oh, there, 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 was, there was your last chance to ever own a first base box. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah I, I opened every set except base first edition and i i don't think i paid what's the most i paid i think i paid 30 3500 for neo neo destiny first edition <laughs> damn yeah but but now i mean so many boxes are above 10 grand i think like i, I think, think like, all watsy and ex era there's some no, there, there's a few ex era that are yeah. below him i i think like call of legends is flirting with it i think some random ones well i know i think i think it was pat flynn who bought his for like 14 his call of legends box oh wow i think don't quote me on that though <laughs> but I, I'm i'm pretty sure I remember hearing of some around 10. I don't remember hearing quite that high, but in that ballpark, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I could see, I mean, I might be more negative than I need to be, but I could see some of the, especially 
Base Jungle Fossil are, are the worst uh, offenders of just, there's so much out there. Well, I can base, see... base has a, like a huge swing in price. Oh, yeah. Like there, there's some that still reach like near 20,000, maybe a little bit over 20,000. And then there's some that you see for like 16,000. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't remember exactly what the prices were like last February, March before before the pandemic and all that. But I don't think we'll get to like pre-pandemic prices on the boxes, but I, I think some of them could still have a ways to go down. Um, and I say that I have a, a fossil box. I bought two for some reason, more than the one that I had opened. I probably shouldn't have bought it yet. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah, I think I think the, I think those are going to be the uh, the worst offenders there. Yeah, yeah. Base Base Jungle Fossil, Base Two Team Rocket. Ooh. Yeah. But yeah, I was overall I was I was surprised by the uh, by the Heritage Auction. I thought I thought everything did did a lot better than what I was expecting, considering how many boxes they actually had up for auction. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then the um, the the tropical mega battle shirt sold for a lot more than I thought it was going to go for. Yeah, yeah, they had some interesting uh, merch type stuff from some of the early tournaments. That, yeah, that were pretty really cool. Yeah, there there was there was a lot there was a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, yeah, I I only just created accounts on heritage and golden a month or two ago i had never really but it seems like they're going to be more more frequent more frequently selling pokemon items like you're doing yourself a disservice i think to not be on those platforms it, it's more work to keep up with everything where, where it's all selling and but buying in those i, I think sometimes those not nothing like buy Yahoo Japan, but buying in those like more restricted markets, a little bit of a higher hurdle creating a heritage account and understanding how to buy on there than yeah. on eBay. So those could present some decent buying opportunities, especially when people sell entire mixed grade sets. <laughs> <laughs> I I wait, I I'm kicking myself for not looking at those because i just looked at the picture and figured it was just the hollow sets yeah anytime like not hollow sets you can heritage auctions like just look at the picture don't read the description because it, it's probably just going to be the hollows let let me maybe buy buy all the all and as the seller like i would be so disincentivized to sell through them like when you literally don't have a picture of everything that I'm selling, that that's kind Plus, of their descriptions are terrible. It's always it's always the same thing talking about like the history of the set and then the artist, like like popular artists. They gotta they gotta up their game when it comes to uh, writing descriptions. There were certain listings too where it would list out like CGC Mint Nine. And it would list, it wouldn't list the names, just the numbers, but like these numbers are this grade, these numbers are nine and a half, these numbers are eight and a half. Some of them, it didn't even list that in the description. You had to like go to some other part of their website with the full description. And then it was still just the number, like it was, it was convoluted to get to what cards were in what grades. But yeah, when you're looking, I bought a gym, gym challenge. <clears throat> um, the non hollows are what do the hollows go to in that set? Twenty. Yeah. So the, there, there's a hundred and twelve non hollows that weren't photographed that most people didn't even know were included. And <laughs> I, I mean, say I, I paid five grand or something for the set. S say they're say they're twenty bucks a piece. Yeah. You know they're gonna average higher than that. Oh yeah, because you get you get the Charmander, the Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, Pikachu. Say they're twenty bucks a piece. That's that's two grand. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it uh, yeah, the, there were, and 
I only won the gym challenge in the jungle and looking back at, I lost some of them by an increment. They could have bid a lot more, but yeah, I should have bid higher and I should have won more than that. I probably should have won all of them. Um, they, they I, I didn't look at the ending price of all of them, but some of the ones I lost a bit on, the buyers got good deals. Yeah, I wish I wish I paid more attention because uh, you you might not have gotten that uh fossil or gym challenge if I knew about that. Yeah, don't uh, don't look at heritage when there's sets up there. <laughs> you buy the buy the boxes, buy the long packs. <laughs> just just assume that all you get is in in the picture for the set. <laughs> Oh man, I'm, I'm leaking too many secrets. You are, you are. You gotta, you gotta quit this. It was, it was fun watching the uh, the heritage auctions because I, I watched, I watched a good part of it live, and I was bidding on stuff, and uh, so that was that was kind of interesting. That was that was the first time I'd ever done that before. I've still yet to watch them live. It was uh, it was my son's birthday party, so I I couldn't participate live, but I had all my bids in the night the night before the thing that the thing i didn't i didn't realize um they do like a whole whole it's like a whole auction block and they started off with magic cards and so my my first i i had them send me a text when the the auction started and the first lot that i was watching was the uh it was like a base box that was up first as the first pokemon auction mm. so i got a text at like one o'clock saying the auctions are starting and i was like oh sweet so i logged on and it's just magic auction after magic after magic it, there was like uh it was i think the base box was lot number 107 mm. so it was 107 lots of magic cards <laughs> it, took, it took about two hours two hours to get through those mm. and then they finally started the pokemon auctions but uh yeah it was it was cool watching it watching it live and being being able to bid and you can you can do like half bids um, when you when you when you do it live. They allow that once per once per lot. Yeah, like, and then there's like bid protection you can put on, and it, it's a different. Yeah, yeah. It's a different style thing. It, it's a very different platform, and you always you got to be aware of the twenty percent buyer's premium, and that is killer right there. Yeah, and and they do a good job of like demonstrating as you yeah, they, click they confirm it. They show it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's old school too. Like when I paid, they charge extra. They charge three percent if you pay by credit card. So I like I printed out my invoice. I, I I printed out my invoice. I mailed it down with a check, like very. And and I actually I bought a couple items on Golden, uh, in the past couple months. It's quite a long process, probably because I'm paying by check. I think since I'm a brand new account buying my first item, I think they hold my check longer. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to get my first golden purchase actually in, in hand. Um, I'm interested to see how long it takes to get these heritage ones, but once they come in and I, I like break them out and get them listed, the, the non hollows, what I'm going to sell. Um, I'll probably do a video of some kind. Yeah, that'd be um, interesting talking through a combination of heritage and how that works. And then talk about the angle that we're talking about now, where I'm going to transition my PSA nine sets over to CGC. That'd be interesting. Yeah. I can't, I can't be, there. Um, I didn't realize heritage was uh, charging the credit card fee and all that. They're making, they're making a killing because you got, you got the 20% buyer premium most times the seller's paying 10% unless it's something really high end. Um, so they're, they're making a good bit of money there. There are, I think we might've talked about this at some point, but like if you're selling something really high end through Heritage or Golden, um, there are agreements that people can get into where they actually get 105%, 110% maybe of strike yeah. price. So, yep. so say you sell a card for a hundred grand with buyer's premium, it's 120. Well, in a normal arrangement, Heritage is going to get the 20,000 buyer's premium in whole. The seller is going to get the 100 or, or whatever. But there are times where a seller can actually negotiate to get more than the hammer price. Yep. yep. That on a high, on a, on a key item, if you sold the PSA 9 Illustrator through Heritage, 
I, I would negotiate to where I was not paying a 20, per, like I was not having the 20% buyer's premium fully go to heritage. Yeah. Yeah. You would negotiate it to where you got 110% or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I know my, my dad used to send a lot of coins to heritage and there, there was one collection that he sent them. That was, it was like a half million dollar collection that was on consignment and he worked it where he didn't pay any uh, like seller's commission, but he didn't get any extra for it either. But um, there, there was no seller's commission. Heritage was just doing, uh, making their money on the buyer's side. Uh-huh. But yeah, there is, there is definitely, it is possible to negotiate with them when, when it comes to these super high end items. And heritage is a little scary now that I'm on there. Cause like, I love coins. Some of the early, <laughs> they're beautiful and they're expensive. Um, oh, yeah. Oh yeah. I need to be careful now that I'm on there, like not tying up too much into a coin collection because <laughs> there's uh yeah, there's some coins that I've seen on there that are just like, I really, really want to have some more of them. <laughs> Yeah, one one of these days I want to uh, I want to get back into coin collecting. I haven't I haven't done much with it recently, or for a couple of years anyway. I I put a couple grand of Pokemon profits from from the mania of 2020 into like starting. I want to build an NGC because I like CGC and that's like the sister company. So I want to build like a NGC uh, type set. Of base, I mean, I don't know how crazy I'll get going back into the 1700s, the the draped bust and the flowing hair. Yeah, uh, that's, that's all, expensive right there. Those are, but I want to build, I'm going to start doing it the wrong way, right? Starting with the cheap ones and then saving the expensive ones for last. That's that's the way you're not supposed to do it. But um, I, I know I'm not going to go for completion, so I don't know how far I'll go, but um, like a typeset, one yeah. Mercury Dime, MS60 or higher, one Walking Liberty Half, one, I mean, I want to do the double eagles and the quarter eagles and flying mm-hmm. Indian scents and or the, the flying eagle scents, the Indian scent. Um, a, a lot of that stuff, the newer stuff can be picked up super cheap, 10, 20 bucks. But... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. At some point, once I go far enough back, I mean, I'm not going to be picking up mint state trade dollars and stuff like that. It's going to be like, at some point, once I hit the 19th century, I'll drop down to like very fine 35 or whatever. And I I think that's what it is, right? Very fine. Extra fine is 40. Yeah, extra fine 40, almost uncirculated is 50. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I was I was talking to someone about uh, I think it was Scott actually. This was way back talking about how, like the how the the coin grading scale differs from a kind of card grading scale. Could you imagine grading cards like they do coins? I um when I, when I just did my coin video, I meant to talk about the difference in the scales, like how how cards are on one to ten, coins are on, two, I think two is the lowest, right? or uh i i I missed that what'd you say what what's the absolute lowest on on coins and do they have one oh yeah good two good two good two i thought so um but yeah it would be it would be interesting if they graded like the pokemon coins on the 70 because i don't know if they borrowed these slabs like i don't know if, if, if this is the same size slab as pcgs it the, the, looks the, very similar. I mean, it actually, I, I don't know how I didn't notice this before, but it, there's no way you'll see it on here, I don't think. Oh, you can. PCGS. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So well, I, did a whole, I, I did a whole video on these, and somehow I, I didn't even notice the PCGS. So, <laughs> so they are using clearly, clearly a PSA. Uh, yeah. Uh, label but the pcgs lab just it, it's weird how they do the coins very niche thing but i i kind of like them just because my history with coins and all that and i, I think they'll be a good uh 
good product to have in the store to oh yeah definitely get a few higher margin lower volume sales here and there have you ever have you ever um are you any good at grading coins i submitted one time ever and i went through annex because ngc and pcgs were like way too expensive um i forget what way too expensive even was but i actually had a um i gotta dig back through my files and, and see what all my coins got but i graded some good coins i graded a 1916d mercury dime oh oh yeah that's a good one that, that that's like the key for the mercury yeah. dime set. one of my favorite sets i think it was like a a very good eight or whatever i forget what very good even is but it, it was quite low um i've never owned an svdb 1909 sv vdb lincoln cent yeah but i did own like the s i'm trying to remember what the other keys were like 1914 d maybe 21 22 d 24 d yeah not not like the main keys, but like the mid tier. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love I love how coins have mintages, and, and you know exactly how many were made. You you don't know how many were lost to time, but like you at least know how many were ma- were, were uh, minted. Yeah, which is really cool. You, it's huge because it's any anything. See, I, I forget anything anything below a million or a hundred thousand. I forget now, but you can, you could literally look in like the coin price guide and anything that had a mintage below either a million or a hundred thousand was considered a key date. Yeah. And, and, and depended on the release a lot though, too. Like, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I want to say SVDB was the only one sub 1 million for wheat cents. Okay. Okay. But if, yeah. if we were looking at like mercury dimes, I mean, they, they made the most sense. They made less of the higher denominations. So yeah, yeah. If you're looking at Walking Liberty halves, there might be multiple releases under a million, but they're not like as much of a key as the SVDB. Um, yeah, yeah. Hour and a half plus, and we're we're probably really losing people talking so much about coins, but <laughs> I, I would imagine so. <laughs> Anyone who's stuck yeah. around this long, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry, I guess, but hopefully you might be into coins too, but <laughs> talking about it now, like tomorrow morning, I'm going to go spend a thousand bucks, like buying my next few coins for my typeset, a hundred percent. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we can end, uh, end tonight's episode. I think, uh, Yeah. <laughs> I think we've we've exhausted our Pokemon talk because clearly we're, we've just gone another direction in the last 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> well, yeah, it was uh, it was it's always been uh, or it's always fun talking to you. It's been a uh, been a fun episode. Yeah, yeah, we had quite the pre episode too. So we're at like, I think we're we're getting towards two hours of this episode, and we talked two hours pre episode. So. <laughs> always a very very fun time to to chat and catch up on what's gone on in the last week or two since we've talked yeah exactly and uh if there if there is anyone still watching um be sure to be on the lookout for our episode in two weeks gonna be gonna be an exciting episode you'll definitely want to stay tuned for that one yep yeah i I have some big news coming up. I'll, I'll release a video next week, but our, we're going to have, we didn't really have a main topic for this episode. Next episode, we'll have a guest. If, if all goes well, hopefully we can, we can align our schedules and make that happen. And we're going to have like a main topic. We'll, we'll still do, I mean, leave your questions if you have any questions for, for our next episode, but we will have a, a bit more of a, a, a theme for the episode and and hopefully have a good discussion with our guest on on the main topic so really looking forward to that next one. Oh, me too me too for sure okay well uh thank you for watching everyone 
it's always it's always fun and we will see you in the next one yep catch you all later